The reading this morning is from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 13. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the river Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt round his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, before we get going today, I want to start with a question. And that is simply, why bother reading the Gospels today? Now, that might seem a really obvious question. I mean, you know, we're a church, the Gospels, they're accounts of the life of Jesus. Why wouldn't we want to read them? But there are some very specific things which the Gospels give us that we actually find nowhere else. And so before we start this journey through Mark's Gospel together, I just want to note what they are. So firstly, the Gospels ground our faith in history. Uh, the Gospels in general, and Mark's Gospel in particular, are the earliest written accounts we have of the life of Jesus. Uh, they were written in the first century, and we know that because, among other reasons, papyri have physically been dug out the ground from that period. And that means that these Gospels, these accounts of the life of Jesus, were written and compiled while other eyewitnesses were still around. Uh, so simply put, if you are one of the gospel writers sitting there in the first century, you can't get away with just making up a load of stuff because there are a whole load of other eyewitnesses around at the time who could just call you out on it. So if you want to encounter Jesus straight up as it were, if you want to meet him, through the eyes of those who were the original eyewitnesses, the Gospels, simply put, are where you got to go. But that is not always easy. And I don't mean easy in terms of understanding. Uh, the Gospels, and, and Mark's Gospel in particular, are, are, are very, very easy to understand in terms of the words on the page. Uh, Mark, in its original language, in fact, is basically the equivalent reading level of a tabloid newspaper. So we can understand what the words say. Uh, the question is more, can we accept what the words on the page say? Or, or will we find its eyewitness presentation of Jesus just a little bit too hard to swallow? Uh, many people over the years have. Uh, that's why centuries later, people wrote other Gospels. Uh, so you might have heard of things like the Gnostic Gospels or the Gospel of Mary Magdalene or the, the Gospel of the Nazarenes. You see, what happened repeatedly throughout history was that the historical person of Jesus Christ came to be seen as inconvenient or incompatible or unbelievable or uncomfortable to the values and philosophies of the day. And so people, what they did is they put pen to paper and they basically wrote their own Gospels. They, they reimagined Jesus with the culture and beliefs and values of their own day. In effect, they made their own Jesus. 
And the problem with that isn't just that the Jesus they created was false. I mean, after all, people believe all sorts of things that turn out to be false. Uh, the problem was actually much more subtle than that. You see, when you lose touch with the real Jesus, you know, even if you keep the outward practice and appearance of Christian faith, when you lose touch with the real Jesus, what you lose touch with is the power to be anything other than what you already are. You see, if the Jesus that you believe in is a Jesus which you have shaped, a, a Jesus which you agree with 100% about everything, a Jesus you find it easy to accept what he says, a, a Jesus who didn't ask from you anything you don't already want to give him, a, a Jesus who fits in with your own intuitions and your beliefs about what is right and what is wrong, if that is the Jesus you believe in, then what you'll discover is that a Jesus like that can't really help you. He certainly can't save you or, or transform the world because he's just you. He has no reality of his own. You know, that's why the Gospels matter so much. They're because they invite us to meet the real Jesus. And by that, I don't just mean the historical Jesus. I mean a Jesus who has his own reality. A Jesus who challenges and surprises us. A Jesus who confronts us and, 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 and challenges so many of the things that we just take for granted in life. And in so doing, has the power to transform not only our life, but eternity itself. That's the Jesus that we're going to meet over these next few months of 2021. Um, so as we start, let's pray and then let's begin. And so we pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, as we spend this time reading these familiar accounts of the life of your Son, uh, we ask you, Lord, for your Spirit to give us fresh insight, fresh openness to receive our King through these words of Mark's Gospel. Help us to understand Jesus. Help us be challenged by Jesus and let his reality transform our reality. For your kingdom's sake, we pray. Amen. Amen. So Mark begins his gospel by telling us that it is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, what do those words mean? Well, Messiah is basically a word that describes a king. Uh, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, that's what it literally means. Uh, these are all ways of saying that here is a king, a saviour, and he is the Son of God. But if you just stopped there, Actually, that verse, verse 1, could mean almost anything. Because actually, throughout the Old Testament, all sorts of human beings have functioned as messiahs. You know, many people have been anointed in some way to bring the people deliverance. And they were called sons of God, uh, God's man on earth, for lack of a better phrase. But it's what come ne comes next that changes that. Because Mark tells us of a voice calling in the wilderness. Uh, the voice will turn out to be John the Baptist, and we'll hear that in a moment. Uh, a voice calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight his paths. Now, those words come from a prophecy from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40. And Isaiah, he foresaw a time when the Lord himself would come to Israel, would come to the city of Jerusalem, and would change everything. Now, over Christmas, we've read that verse a lot, so let me just try and show you what a big deal it is to have it right here at the start of Mark's Gospel. You see, the word we translate Lord is the Hebrew word Yahweh, uh, which was the personal name of God, a name so holy, so synonymous with the presence of being in God, that even to this day, Orthodox Jews don't even write it down in full. Yahweh has come. That's what Mark tells us at the start of his gospel. I've got good news for you. Good news of a saviour, a messiah, a king, but not like any other saviour, any other messiah, any other king you've ever heard of, because Yahweh has come. The Lord has come. And it's that revelation that is unpacked for us further as we get to verses 9 and 10 and see Jesus baptised. And again, you're probably familiar with this story. You probably know the imagery, the voice, the dove and all that. So let me just try and help you receive these verses afresh. 
And actually one of the things that unlocks these verses for us is to realize that the image of the dove isn't actually a common image in the Old Testament. In fact, one of the very few places it does appear is in the Genesis story as it was told colloquially by the people. You see, by the time of Jesus, most people didn't speak Hebrew. Uh, the language of the day was Aramaic. That's what they spoke in the streets. And because the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, what happened over the years was that Jewish scholars made a sort of easy to understand version of the Old Testament in Aramaic, and they called it the Targums. Um, and on page one of the Targums, uh, you hear the Genesis story and about God speaking the words of creation and the, the spirit hovering over waters. And the way the Targums tried to bring those words to life for the ordinary people of the day was by using the image of the dove. The dove hovering over the waters as God speaks, let there be light. And that's what we're being shown here at the beginning of Mark's Gospel. The Creator God, here he is, he's come. And as Jesus being baptised, you could also almost imagine the image of the crowds at the riverside, you know, looking up from the tabloid editions of the Old Testament from the Targums. And it's almost as if as they look up, they're taken back to the very beginning of creation. The Creator is here and he's on his way to Jerusalem. That's what Mark is opening his gospel by telling us. He's come, he's beginning a new work of creation through his word made flesh and here in the wilderness. He's giving you the opportunity to come and be a part of it, to come and begin again, to have this new start as you receive not just a Messiah, but the Messiah, not just a Son of God, but the Son of God, the one in whom the very love and power of the Creator has come amongst us, defeating darkness and bringing his kingdom here. Will you come and hear his message? That's what's being shown to us in his opening words of Mark's Gospel. Now, there are all sorts of ideas in that, but we will meet again as we go through the Gospels and we'll come back to them in later weeks. But right now, I just want us to focus on how these verses help us get ready to receive Jesus, to receive the real Jesus who actually has the power to change our lives. And the first thing is to do by recognizing what these verses tell us about belief. Because depending on who you are and what your story is, there are all sorts of reasons you might have for not wanting to believe in the real Jesus or feeling you're not able to fully commit to him. Now, those reasons might be intellectual. Uh, those reasons might arise from your lifestyle or your cultural background or your, your history of the church. There are any number of reasons why you might have for why it's hard to believe in Jesus. And part of what Mark wants to say to you is this. Uh, just, just keep in mind that all these original first century believers in Jesus Christ, they are Jews, including Mark. And as such, they have way more intellectual and cultural and personal barriers to believing that God could become a human being than you or I do. You know, these are the guys, remember, who couldn't even speak or write the name of God. In fact, the very notion that God could become a human being was absolutely antithetical to everything their culture believed in, everything they'd ever been taught about reality from birth. And yet... That is precisely what they came to believe. And what changed their minds? Well, Mark is going to show us in his gospel. So read on as a message. That's the first thing. Don't settle for a made-up Jesus just because you don't think you could possibly ever see yourself believing in or accepting the real deal. Mark wants to show us the eyewitness testimony which has changed his mind and by so doing, take us on the same journey that he has been on, the journey of meeting the real Jesus. That's the first thing. Now, secondly, recognize that this journey will at some point bring you into the wilderness too. See, here at the start of Mark's Gospel, everything is happening in the wilderness. You know, John the Baptist is preaching in the wilderness. Uh, the people have to go out to the wilderness to be baptized. Uh, but the devil is defeated in the wilderness. It, it, it's all happening in the wilderness. And partly, of course, that's just history, you know. These events had to happen somewhere, 
And it turns out even today that that part of Israel is still basically a sort of low-grade desert. But the reason Mark emphasizes the wilderness so much in his introduction is again to tee up an idea that he's going to come back to again and again in the gospel. And that is this theme of beginning again with God. You see, time and time again in the Old Testament, it's in the desert where people meet God, uh, begin again with God. Uh, so whether it's Moses at the burning bush or, or Jacob resting with God or, or Israel wandering around for 40 years, it all happens in the wilderness. Because what is the wilderness? Well, the wilderness fundamentally is a place that cannot sustain life. It's a place of thorns because nothing grows. It's a place where there's nothing to eat. It's a place of thirst because all wells are dry. It, it's a place of terrible loneliness because there's no community. There's nothing out there to support life. But in the Bible, the wilderness is the place where in that lifelessness, people learn a lesson. The lesson we all need to learn one way or another and that, is, it, and that is that God is not a supplement to life. God is not a choice we make. God is not someone we might just check in on from time to time. The wilderness is a place where you learn that God is life. Where you learn that all wells will ultimately run dry except for his well. That all bread will ultimately go stale apart from the bread that comes from him. That's what the wilderness in the Bible is. The place that makes you look again at the foundations on which your life is built and see that without God, without his intervention, without his gift, without his grace, it will all come to nothing. The wilderness is essentially a place where you learn to stop trusting yourself, stop trying to be independent, stop trying to be self-relying, self-limiting, self-fulfilling, and start learning to trust in God. And that's what the significance of baptism was. Uh, within Judaism, there were all sorts of rituals that people did with water. You know, various ablutions, various special washing of hands, and we, we'll learn about a few of them in a few weeks' time. Um, and in fact, if you were a Gentile, then this hand washing on its own, that wasn't enough. If you were a Gentile, that's, that's a non-Jew, and you wanted to go and meet God in the temple, then actually you didn't just have to wash your hands, you had to wash your whole body. But here's the thing. All those rites, all those washings with water, there were always things you did to yourself and for yourself. You, you washed your own hands, you cleansed your own body. But the Gospel of Mark begins with an invitation to come into the wilderness and be baptised. That's not something you do for yourself, it's something that is done for you and done to you. And John the Baptist says that that's a symbol, an anticipation of the one who would come, uh, the one who could baptise with the Holy Spirit, the one who, because of what he will do, will make it possible to let you and I begin again, could make the wilderness experience a place of new creation, a place of divine sufficiency, not self-sufficiency. And Mark says, right at the start of his gospel, I've got good news for you. That Messiah, the Son of God, the Lord himself, he's come. So let's meet him together in the pages of my gospel. That's the journey we're going to be going on at the start of 2021, meeting the real Jesus through the eyewitnesses, those who met him, whose own lives were transformed by him and want him to transform our lives and our eternities too, as we go out into the wilderness, as we let ourselves be humbled before Jesus, let us see the fragility and insufficiency of our lives, and let us see in him a life that, as it is laid down for us, has a power to bring us back to true and real life, as we meet the true and real Jesus. Amen.
you. Hear?